Okay, so I'm going to show you an example of how to do all of this CSS layout stuff um, because it's going to it involves a lot of complicated things. If you've got the example, it's this layout example folder. Um, here's the index and the styles.css. I have these loaded up in Notepad, so I can start to edit these. And I've got a this is what the index file actually looks like when you preview it in the browser. Really, really simple website. There's hardly anything to it yet. These links don't even work or do anything special. Um, and there's lots of misspellings in here. Um, so I just want to go over the the HTML really quickly just to show you there is already a link to the CSS file so I can just start working in it. And then I've got a bunch of these div tags. And if you think of divs as boxes, they're simply text boxes like in Word that you can push and pull around the page and change to different sizes and give them their own styles. So I've got one that's the container. goes around everything. It's nested just inside the body tag. Um, then there's a header, a navigation, a content, a sidebar, and at the bottom there's a footer. So what I usually like to do, the way that I start this out, is once I've built my div structure, I know the big blocks that are supposed to be on the page, I go into my CSS and I create a rule for each one. So there was a container, a header, a navigation, a content, is that right? Yeah, content, sidebar, and footer. I find this makes it a lot easier than trying to create them one at a time. Just create all the rules so I know everything that I'm uh, supposed to use at the beginning. And each one just gets a pound symbol in front of them. <coughs> so as people are typing this in, um, I'm going to do some stuff to the container so that it uh, makes my site nice and contained. Uh, the first thing that most people will usually do is give your entire site a width of something. Um, 960 is a very popular width. For this particular example, I'm going to go down to 800 just because my screen resolution is set so low for the recording. Um, but if you want to, you can set that to 960 and that'll be perfectly fine. Then I need to take the whole thing, I'd like to center it on the page. The vast majority of websites you probably see are either left aligned or centered on the page. So this is that weird margin thing. Margin, you can do zero, auto. The zero means zero on top and bottom, and the auto means auto left and right. And that's the thing that will actually center this on the page. And if I preview it, there you go, there's my 800. Well, it's kind of my 800. I can't quite tell where everything is. So let me also give this, well, let me jump this down so it's easier to read. There we go. Now you can actually tell what's going on here. Let's give it a background dash color. Color. Uh, something pretty easy to find. Yellow. So now I can see where everything is inside my container. I'll leave that up for you to copy. Container we typically don't need to worry about padding or the, the text moving, the text being right up against the edge. Most of that's going to be controlled inside the, uh, the sub items, the nested uh, div tags. Um, this one. So the next thing I'd like to do is I really just want to go from top to bottom trying to redesign this. Um, header is going to be my next thing that I want to play with. Um, I don't think I'm going to do too much to it other than give it a height of 100 pixels and say a um, Uh, background color of blue. There we go. T 
typically in a header, you're not going to have that much text, uh, especially with this, these beginner exercises. What you're probably going to end up having is a big graphic that goes in your, uh, in your header. So I have a nice defined area. If I go to Photoshop and I need to create a banner graphic for this, I know it's 800 pixels wide and I know it's 100 pixels tall. So I can go into Photoshop and make a, a graphic exactly that size. And then in, in my HTML, instead of the word header, I can drop in an IMG SRC equals images slash header dot JPEG alt equals whatever my alt would necessarily be. Height equals 100 and width equals 800. Now this is not going to work because I don't actually have that file created, but it should show me where it would go. It's going to give me the nice little X in the corner. And all I would have to do in my file is create a new images folder and then inside here once I'm done with it in Photoshop I can create that graphic and throw it in there and it'll start running. I don't have an example of that for you though. So there's the image tag that I just dropped in. I wish I could split these in half and you could see both at the same time. Can you? can do it. Okay, so now you can see both at the same time. There's my HTML on the left. I just pulled out the tab so it's one's on each side. Okay, so my header is not too bad. Um, the navigation area is what I want to tackle next. And there's a bunch of different ways that I can approach this. I can make this navigation be a list across, uh, a horizontal navigation across the top. I can make it a sidebar down the left, and then this content area will be the big area in the middle, and then there's actually another sidebar that's supposed to go over to the right. Um, there's all kinds of different ways. Since chapter 7 in the book is the more complicated chapter where you're going to do a three-column layout, I figured I'd show you that one first, um, sort of go all out, and then the two-column one you'll do in Chapter 6 will seem a lot easier. So what I need to do is the navigation, the content, and the sidebar. Navigation is that block, content, and sidebar. I want all three of these blocks to form three columns in the middle. So in order to do that, they all have to float. Um, so I'll do float left. I'm actually going to do that for all three of them. What that will end up doing is floated objects stack horizontally. So this is the nav area, and it's floated to the left, so it goes over to the left. The content area is this stuff right here. It's also floated to the left, but it was down here, and what it ends up doing is it goes to the left, but it stacks to the right of the next floated object. The same with the sidebar. And then my footer is kind of trying to cram up into the leftover space. So this looks like a complete and utter mess. Not to mention, it's spinning out the bottom of the page. Ah! It looks horrible. Um, don't worry, we can fix all of that. So here's my code again. Um, this might also help. Outline 1px solid black. Divs are inherently invisible. And what I can, let me make sure I got that code right. What I can do is I can add an outline to them so that I can actually tell where they are. Because right now it's really hard to figure out where stuff is on the page. So this is a nice little... Um, diagnostic trick that I use often. I don't actually want the outline to be a part of my design at the end. Um, I'll, actually, I'll even do this to the footer. 
I don't, I don't want it to be out, uh, outlined forever. I will take that off at the end once I, I get my design down. But once those outlines are in there, I can actually see where the boxes are. It's still kind of messed up, but at least I can tell where stuff is supposed to be. So it's the same line, it's the same line for navigation content, sidebar, and footer. Just outline one pixel solid black. It's not really a design, it's just a diagnostic tool. Alright, the CSS is starting to get big. Oh, well, probably not. Just my screen's so small. Do you need to see that larger? I see some people craning their necks to see it. Okay. There we go. Is that a little easier to see? And just copy and paste it to each each one so you can tell what's going on. Okay. Navigation content sidebar. I'm going to do this. Width of my navigation is going to be 20%. The width of the sidebar is also going to be 20%. What does that mean I've got left over for the width of my content? Yeah, 60. So the navigation content and sidebar, since they're supposed to be three columns, I'm just going to divvy them up. Um, now, if you have 960 as your width, this is still going to work. We don't actually need to do any math to get the percentages to work out. The computer will figure out what uh, these are supposed to be. So if I do this, ah, it's a little bit better. Each one takes up part of the uh, overall width of the shape, the width of the, the full width. If I actually do change my container up to 960, where you guys might be doing that, it doesn't matter. I don't have to recalculate the math on this. The computer is doing it for me. I love that. Now, there's other weird stuff going on. You can probably see there's a bunch of extra lines around here, and there's this line here. This is actually the footer line. Um, if you remember what I told you the other day about floated objects, Floated and non-floated objects do not play together. Floated things are actually ripped off the page. Everything else is, all the non-floated stuff is drawn. And then the floated stuff is just slapped back on top of it. And literally overlapping the non-floated objects. That's weird. And it's something that you have to deal with. The way to fix that is with the footer. This is where you put in clear both. Actually, I guess we only used float left, so I could just do float uh, clear left here, but I prefer to do both so that if anything ever changes, it doesn't screw things up. What that does is it tells the footer that it is supposed to run underneath of all of the different floated objects. When it does that, the container that goes around everything, that also has to get pulled down in order to contain the footer. So just that one line suddenly starts to clear everything up. Um, yeah. Now, you're probably also going to get to the point where you would like to do some kind of, um, or you want to do a little bit more design. Specifically, I'd like to get things off of the edges here. See how this text is right up against the left border here? It kind of looks gross. I would like it to have a little breathing room. So over in my sidebar, I can do padding of 10 pixels. And suddenly it drops down to the next line. Because the 10 pixels was actually added to the 20%. It's now bigger than it should be. Um, padding can actually be kind of a pain in the butt with, uh, with this kind of design. Um, so let me try something else. make this 18%. Oops, let's keep that padding for now. Let's make it 16%. Maybe that'll fit. There we go. Uh, no, I just left padding for now. I, I didn't mean to do margin. I set it back to padding. There. So these are the two lines that I just changed. 
in the sidebar. Actually, I think I could probably go back up to 17. So if you look at the, the example that I've got now, my sidebar is actually floating kind of off to the floating off to the to the right side, um, but it's actually still got a little gap right here. What you may end up doing on your on your right-handed sidebar is instead of floating it left, I could float it to the right, and then it's going to be all the way over here on the edge, and it's going to form a little bit of a gap between the two um, cells or between the two. Uh, what are they? Divs. Um, I'd like something similar to happen here, where there's a little bit of padding inside, and then there's a whole bunch of, um, and then there's some gutter space in between. And I will tell you, it's actually incredibly difficult to get that little bit of gutter using um, pixels and percentages. It's actually best to stick to one or the other. Um, for everything. And in fact, percentages is the more difficult. So I'm going to switch all the, and this is what I also want you to understand is that you can switch this stuff at any time when you find out that something's not working quite right. So I'm actually going to switch this back from um, percentages. I'm actually going to figure out the pixel values for this. So with my width of navigation, I'm going to make that 200 pixels. I'm going to make the width down here 200 pixels, and I think my width is still at 960, so that leaves me 400, 560. Did I do the math on that right? Yes, I did. Did yours, do you still have a, the right-hand sidebar dropping down underneath when you change these numbers? The reason that's happening is that, at least in my example, the width, when I change it to 200, it's adding 10 pixels to all four sides. So there's 10 on the left and 10 on the right. So this isn't 200 wide. It's actually 220 wide because the padding is added on to it both left and right. So when you add padding, it's actually best to subtract that amount from your width. There we go, now it fits. And I would like to do the same to all of the other um, cells as well. So I'm going to add 10 pixels of padding to my content and to my navigation so that they're off the sides. And then I need to subtract 20 pixels from both of their widths. And what I'm trying to get here is this little area in between so that things aren't quite, uh, so that text is not quite lined up on these uh, outlines. Like, uh, there's only about two more things that I want to uh, do to this particular example. Yes? Do you have the container with that? I think I changed it back up to 960. So, yeah, all my widths and plus padding have to add up to 960. Okay. If you want to adjust the numbers for that, that's fine. Or if you just want to easily, it might be easier to change the, uh, the width. Then your math is wrong somewhere. If it still doesn't fit. <laughs> you find it? All right. Um, I have page contente. So the only other thing I, I really want you guys to be aware of is these uh, my navigation buttons over here. They don't really look like a nav bar. It's an unordered list. And uh, a little bit later in the semester, I'm gonna, I've got a big tutorial on how you turn unordered lists into navigation bars, both horizontal and vertical. 
but I'll show you the um, how you get this started. When you uh, let me write out the rules first. And let me space this out just a little bit. So this is a new type of CSS rule, uh, a way that you can write them. What this means is select the unordered list inside the navigation div. That's the space literally means that this, the thing on the right should be nested inside of the thing on the left. And of course, that's exactly what's going on in our HTML. There's the unordered list opening and closer, and it's nested inside of the navigation div. And you can see that this goes down to several levels. This will select the list item that's nested inside the unordered list that's nested inside. It's like the little dog who swallowed a fly at the bottom of the sea song. At the end, I'm going to get into the A tag. That's in, So I can control each one of these three items, but only inside the nav, uh, navigation area. For the unordered list, it's list style type none. Some browsers like it here, some browsers like it here, and it will get rid of the bullet. Bullets are gone. Hey, that actually looks like a list of links now. But there's this humongous gap on the left. That's actually controlled by margins. Um, unordered lists and list items have this really big left margin on them, and we can actually override that. Let me pull these down a little bit so you can see it. Margin zero. And again, some browsers like it on the unordered list, and some like it on the list item. Oops, that's not margin, it's padding. I think I was wrong on that. I was wrong. I'm sorry, it was padding, not margin. Oops. The next thing I want to create is to actually make these look more like buttons. I can even make them have little rollover effects on them. In order to do this, we need to be able to apply the box model to each of the A tags. If you remember the other day, the box model was one of those things that kind of made sense. You probably understood that there's margin and border and padding and then content, but it doesn't really make too much sense until you start to see this. A tags are inline elements. That means they do not get the full box model. You can't give them a margin height or a um, padding on the top and bottom. You can't control their height. Um, but what you can do is change an item from being inline to being a block level element. If I give this the outline, you'll end up seeing that these will become little blocks that I can now start to control as though they were well, little, little tiny div tags. And because, and this is probably also a little bit confusing at first, but this selector right here tries to grab everything that it can that fits this criteria. It wants to grab every single A tag that's nested inside a list item, that's nested inside an unordered list in the navigation area. So it's what I put in this rule, these styles, will apply to all of these. If I add more links, they'll all get this exact same style just because of where they're nested. Um, let's do height of 20 pixels. Um, and feel free to mess around with these numbers however you like. That's a little bit small still. Let's make it bigger. There we go. Um, text align center. There we go. There is not an easy way to vertically center in CSS. 
this is one of the things that was just overlooked in its creation. Um, and so we had to come up with these weird hacks to make it happen. In order to get the, the these text to come down just a little bit so that they're vertically centered in their in their boxes, I need to do line dash height and set it to the same as the height. Line height is actually kind of this it's usually your line spacing, single, double, like you can in Word. Um, you can set any specific number you want. But what this does is it actually takes this number, divides it in half, puts half on top and half on bottom. And that ends up doing the vertical centering. Uh, I'll do one more. Text decoration none. And that gets rid of the underline. The only other thing I'd really like to change is, is I told you you can make a hover effect so that when the mouse goes over it, that it changes somehow. In order to do this one, it's a it's actually a new rule. It's going to look like this. I'm going to put it right after the ones that we just did. The first part is identical to the one that we were just doing, but you have to add colon hover. And what this will do is it will inherit every single bit of these styles. All of this information is considered by default inside this, this um, hover rule. So I can blow that up a little. But what I can then do is start to make some changes. Background dash color uh, red. I can change the font color to white. And I can set the text decoration to underline. All of the other properties will stay the same. This one will simply override a few of them. Let's see if it works. Haha. Is it working? Um, be careful. Whenever there's one of these uh, properties on the left, if there if there are two words, they have to have a dash in between them. Uh, the reason is that anytime CSS sees a space, it thinks it's a new thing. It doesn't know that this is that you want this all to be one command. So they had to have this dash in there to link the words together. That's one of the big mistakes I see in CSS. Um, yeah. Let me make this just a little bit more professionally proper for you. You found it? Yeah. Okay. Was it small? No. It was, uh, I had space between the hover and the hover. Ah, the yes. Yeah, there, there, there can be no space here. Uh, anyway. To make this just a little bit more professionally proper, this is, we should do this. Uh, you probably can't read that now. States, uh, links come in four different states. Link and hover, I'm sorry, actually five different states. Link and hover are the, the two main ones that you have to worry about. Um, the other one is called, the other ones I do want you to be aware of is, uh, the next one is called visited. You know when you click on a link and it turns purple? That's what visited is. And what I normally suggest is that you apply this exact same style for your regular plain old blue links to this new, to, to visited. The way to do that is to put a comma and instead of link, visited. And I'll put that down on a new line so you can see it. This is all one giant selector. But because there's a comma here, it's actually two selectors just grouped together. It's going to take the link and the visited. Um, let me show you what this happens without this. So without this, I get F5. There we go. I don't know if you can tell, but they are. Uh, they did turn purple. They're not blue anymore. And if I undo and put that back in, oh, I didn't set a color for this, did I? Let me do that. Color black. Now my links, the text is black on them.
Oh, this yellow color is coming through from the container, I believe, if you remember that from 20 minutes ago. Um, they don't have to be. I could background color white. That'll work. There you go. You can play around with these colors all you want. In fact, you don't have to use colors. Uh, you could do backgrounds and go grab a URL. I know you've done this a couple of times. Images slash navbg.jpg or something like that. Um, you, so you could add a, a image to the background of each one of these divs, each one of these uh, rollovers. I'm going to undo that because I think that's a little bit more complicated than you need right now. So Lincoln Visited are two of the important ones. The other ones that you need to worry about are called Focus and Active. And there's a specific order of these. Back, back. Navigation A, focus, comma, active. And these, this, these three should be part of the last one. Let me demonstrate to you what, what this does. Focus is for people who have to use the tab key on the keyboard. If you use tab or shift tab, it goes through the different um, links on the page. If somebody doesn't have fine enough motor control to use a mouse, but they can they can hit the tab key, that's very common. Um, this this will help them. Without this, it just puts a little dotted border around which item is currently selected. Uh, then you hit either space or enter to activate the link. Hover does the same thing, so you can see I actually have tab or focus and hover active uh, running at the same time. Active doesn't really work but you're supposed to keep it in anyway. What Active does is, as you're clicked down on the mouse over top of a link, uh, this actually happens in regular plain old HTML, the links turn red. Most of the browsers don't actually do this. Most of them are so fast now that they do it for less than uh, a couple of mil or just a couple milliseconds and you never ever see it. Um, there are a few browsers, some old ones that are slow enough to actually show you Active, but I've just been told to keep it in by some other professionals, so if you see it, that's what's going on. You can use this pattern to create nav bars anywhere on the page. So if I need to create another one over here in my sidebar, I can do that real quick for you. I can take this entire unordered list, copy it into my sidebar. I don't know why you would want to have an uh, your navigation on both sides of the page, that'd be a little weird, but you could. I've got one over here. See how it's not affected? There's no style on this at all. None of this cool hover effect is happening. That's because all of the rules that we just wrote start with pound navigation, so they only affect the one inside there. Um, the only other place that I really want to show you this is in the, oh, in the content area. I can do pound content h1. There's also pound content paragraph tags. In the in my content area, I'll blow that up. There's an h1 tag and there's a paragraph tag. If I write a rule specific for those, I can give them whatever properties I like. Um, font dash family Ariel Helvetica um, Sam Serif. I think I spelled that right. Uh, color red. Oops, font dash size 24px. Not that this is a great design, but you can see that I can control just this H1 on the page. Uh, I can do the same for the paragraphs. Um, change the font a little bit. Um, oh, 
this is kind of a cool thing. I'll just show you this one extra thing. Text indent uh, 20px. You can actually have your paragraphs have that nice little first line indent like you were taught to do in every English class. HTML does not do indents by default on paragraphs. But you can take your paragraph tags and add that using the CSS. And Andrew, you wanted to see how to uh, center a picture on the page, right? So I'm going to need a picture to do that. So images.google.com. Kittens. There we go. Oh, God. I hate cats. I'm allergic to cats. It's so gross. I'm allergic to them, but I still love them. <laughs> Uh, desktop, I'm going to call it kitten, put it in my, where's my layout example, images folder, save it there. Make sure it's saved properly. Okay, so I've got an image. In my HTML, I need to bring it onto the page. So probably the best way to do that is here in my content area. src equals images slash kitten.jpg. I don't know how big this is supposed to be. Oh, geez, that's huge. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me fix that real quick in Photoshop. Um, I'm going to shrink this down to something much more manageable. Image, image size, I will make you 200 pixels across. And then just do a quick save as, or save for web. JPEG, I can give it a little bit more. JPEG 50, 5 kilobytes, that's plenty. And I'll just save it over top of itself. Go away, Photoshop. All right, let's see if that fixed it. Oh, thank God. <laughs> All right, so you wanted to see how you can center this on the page. Um, the... One of the better ways to do this is going to be, we've got it on the page. Now I need to give it a, a class. I'm going to do this. A class equal to the word center. Now I haven't created that class yet, so I have to go over into my CSS. And I'm going to create dot center. Now you might think that it might be something easy like text align. Center. Actually, this might work. It does not. Wait, did I save everything? So many different files now. Okay. That did not work. It wasn't supposed to. Um, the, there's a couple of problems with that particular way of doing things. Instead, what I'm going to do is div class equals center. And I'm going to get rid of the center off of the image. So I'm going to wrap it inside of a, a div that will get that will make it centered. The div is a block level element, so it's going to be wrapped around, it's actually taking up the entire space here. I can put an outline on that and see it. I'm just putting that outline thing. And what it does is it's going to take everything inside of it and center it, but this block will also keep everything else away from it. So there won't be text on either side of it. Um, it will actually, if I put a paragraph below it or after it, they will not interfere with each other. So is that what you were looking for? Cool. The only thing that I think is incredibly necessary now is now that I've got my design pretty much how I need it, I've got to get rid of these outlines. They're hideous and they shouldn't be there. Content, get rid of outline. Probably could have done a finer replace. There we go.
not the greatest design in the world, um, but not bad either. Uh, the, oh, the footer. I did want to do one last thing on the footer real quick. Um, it's got to be cleared, but I wanted to add some padding on the inside, and I actually do want to center the text inside there, text line center. That just makes the footer a little bit nicer. Let's give it a background color. Background dash color red. So that looks a little bit nicer. Please choose nicer colors for your what are the stuff that you do. Um, yeah, these are pretty hideous. <laughs> you did say the first project would be pretty hideous. Yeah. <laughs> Now your design does not need to be this complicated for your first project. You're not even going to have a navigation bar, but chapter six and seven is starting to get you ready for the, the next um, project, which is going to have to have a, a navigation bar across, across the top. So I hope this helps clarify how some of the some of this works. For your second project, this would be actually be a great thing to copy. Um, use this design. I, I, I've created this design a million times. I use it a million times in almost every single project, and I try not to reinvent the wheel with each one. Uh, okay.